Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're going to be talking about organizations that provide services to people living with disabilities and with and to their families with special guests, Tracy Gardner, CEO of Easter Seals, Louisiana, Tom Gillespie, President and CEO of Living Well Disability Services in Minnesota, and Charles McLister, CEO and President at Elwin in Philadelphia. And so thank you all for joining. It's great to see you all. Uh, your organizations uh, all play a really distinctive role. Our neighbors, our families, our friends are affected by different, different abilities. We all have, have those different abilities. And you've been around for a really long time, Charles. Elwin has been along, has been around, and I see that in your in your in your background since 1852. Talk about the establishment of this institution before the Civil War and how the organization has continued to serve people throughout this period of time, throughout the last 150 years. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. And I, I really am grateful for the opportunity to be part of the conversation. Uh, as you mentioned, we're the oldest nonprofit of our kind, founded in Philadelphia in 1852. We support people of all ages uh, with developmental challenges and related behavioral health issues. Our support starts with early intervention for kids age three to five, uh, special education offerings for both primary and secondary students, behavioral health for, for adults and children, uh, and comprehensive lifelong support for adults in homes, day programs, supported employment, and a variety of healthcare and behavioral health wraparound support. Uh, each year, we support almost uh, 18,000 people in eight states with uh, almost 4,000 employees. So we started as a school in Germantown uh, section of Philadelphia, uh, later moved to our campus and media. Um, but we've grown quite a bit since uh, 1852 and have been through and seen a lot. Uh, I called you, Charles, Tom, and now I'm going to call on, to, on Tom. Uh, Tom, I, I, I guess I have to call you Charles now. But <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this, this description of, of the services that, uh, that Charles provides for, for Elwood, it's very familiar to you, isn't it, Tom? It is. And, and uh, Mark, I'll, I'll say I, I've been called worse. So, so uh, you know, that, <laughs> that, that's just fine with me. Uh, like uh, like Charles, I, I, I want to say thank you for, for the opportunity to, to join today. And, and it is familiar for, for me. I, I started uh, working in group homes in college and it's all I've ever done other than worked overnight at a gas station. So it's uh, it, it's a passion for me. Uh, but uh, the Living Well Disability Services, we're, we're based in uh, the, the Minneapolis, St. Paul uh, metro area. Uh, and we we've been around. We're just starting our 50th year, so so we're uh, we're we're just infants compared to Elwin over there. But uh, but we we were started by a group of parents who uh, took exception with the the way that their children were uh, uh, were were served, or you know the the lack of service opportunities, and uh, those families really uh, took up with uh, with community support and uh, and, and started uh, what what we think is uh, is a much better uh, way for for our folks to be served. So. Uh, we currently operate about 40 group homes in the uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul metro area. We serve about 300 people uh, in those group homes, but also customized supports in their homes, uh, you know, sending uh, our staff out to help families, help individuals who live in their own homes uh, live as, uh, as connected a life as possible. And Easter Seals, Tracy, Easter has been around since uh, the 20s, hasn't it? Yes, Mark. So uh, again, thank thank you for having me. And I've never been called Tom or Charles, so thank you. <laughs> um, lots of commonalities, guys. You know, lots of similar roots. Um, Easter Seals, Louisiana, is a member of the 101 year old um, National Easter Seals family of nearly 70 affiliates, which annually impact um, about one and a half million individuals uh, around the world. And here at Easter Seals, Louisiana, each year we support about 10,000 individuals across the lifespan. Our participants range from newborns uh, with or at risk for having disabilities to children and adults with autism and other developmental and or intellectual disabilities to seniors wishing to age in place whether, rather than facility placement and uh, to persons living with a variety of behavioral health challenges. And um, very similar, Tom and Charles, um, our scope of support ranges from linkage and referral to direct hands-on offerings, including education, training, and treatment. You know, the, the, 
The way we treat uh, people is so important in terms of, of who we are. And in this country, we have gone through these phases uh, where we have tried to hide away people who are different, uh, ignore them, marginalize them, um, erase them out of existence. Um, and, and over the years, we've tried to evolve that. We started off with medical institu institutionalization, which was uh, barely um, an improvement um, over hiding people was just another way to, to hide them. And now we're getting more into integration. I'd love you for you all to, to comment on how we need to adjust our attitudes, continue to adjust our attitudes. And then we'll go into the actual uh, kind of programs that you have. But Tracy, since we're, since we're with you, how do you feel about American society's attitudes, our community, my attitude toward people who have difference? And how do you, how do you um, suggest that we get into a situation where we're more educated and more involved? Sure. No, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Mark. And I think that that's a, a question that we all, you know, struggle with and, and spend a lot of, of our, our time thinking through and trying to figure out how to make things better. But yeah, to me, it, it's important really to mention the, the passing of the Americans with Disability Act in 1990, which, you know, in our, in our world was, you know, the most sweeping legislation uh, to date. So, you know, here we are 32 years later uh, and, and having my, my career is pushing 30 years at this point. So I started right after there, the trickle down of the ADA was happening in the States and it truly was landmark. Um, it, I think we've seen sweeping improvement in how we in this country accommodate people with differing abilities, you know, beginning with the prohibition of discrimination and other workforce enhancements over the last 30 years. Obviously, we've had the architectural and environmental improvements uh, in, in many aspects, including transportations and building, buildings and facilities. But as you said, Mark, we still have a long way to go in the areas of, of real appropriate person-centered recognition. Um, a lot of that's connected with funding. Much of it is connected with education. Um, and understanding. I think also awareness, just, just, just talking about it like, like we are. Uh, uh, Tom, you know, there's only so far laws can go, right? I mean, you can't legislate attitude, but you yeah. can start to ensure that people are treated similarly, and that can create a different consciousness, right? The, the idea of, well, you can't just marginalize and hide individuals you can't just ignore their needs but laws, yeah, I, laws are I, not I, it right not, laws are not where the action go, is really no i mean uh, yeah i mean they they help define the playing field if you will but you know whether it's awareness whether it's familiarity you know i, I think that's that's really what we're chasing and and it uh, it, it should should be a, a focus on relationships on connections on you know really connecting people to the the community around them and, and making sure that that community um, has the education and the awareness and, and the, the ability to lift those folks up. But, uh, but laws only take us so far, and, and they, they help us define the playing field, for sure. And Charles, in the, in the 150 years that you've operated, or more than 150 years, um, how, how, what kind of changes have you seen? I mean, there used to be this idea of sending somebody away to an institution, also to an institution that was called a school. And now we're, we're not sending people away anymore. So even the idea of schooling has a different purpose. So could you talk a little bit about how you have evolved, how your leaders through, the, through this uh, century and a half have changed how the organization actually functions? Because you're not functioning the same way you did 150 years ago today. Well, we're not, we're not as, uh, and uh, probably... Uh, you know, we have work to do still, I think, you know, some of those practices and habits are so deeply rooted and, and go back so far that you can be surprised at, you know, how you can encounter them today. And then the, the other side of the coin is, you know, there, there, there's, all, there's been this one size fits all uh, approach. And that starts with, you know, uh, organizations like Elwin, which, you know, we literally had a campus which had thousands of residents. We had our own hospital, our own blacksmith and it was you know it was intended to um, 
uh, you know, this, this benevolent isolation, you know, that's well intended, uh, and, and no one's, you know, envisioning that we're we're, we're depriving people of independence or, or or choice. But in fact, you know, uh, that is what was happening. And so, it's tough for organizations as old as ours to shake some of those, some of that legacy and those practices. And you have to be very intentional. I, I think laws, in in in, in our case, uh, tend to be tra- uh, trailing indicators. You know, they they follow change. Uh, by, by the time uh, the laws caught up to what I think was happening uh, uh, in, in places like Elwin, where we were opening up and moving our support into the communities, uh, uh, you know, that, that was already in play. And I, and, I, and I think that's a good thing that we can try to set the tempo for change uh, as, as leaders of organizations in this space. I think you made such a great point. We just completed a poll in which we said, what is the greatest challenge for those who live with developmental disabilities? And two points received the most votes. One is the ignorance, attitudes, and behaviors of others. And the other side is, is the practical practicalities, stable living environment, um, the, the uh, appropriate supportive services, and so on. So it's, it's very interesting, the point that you're making, uh, Charles, because what you're saying is that from the best of intentions, perhaps um, we reach the false conclusions. We try, but we need to evolve as well simultaneously. And maybe we need to also give, give each other a break because we all have our blind spots, right? And it could be in, in race, it could be in religion, it could be in, in an, a, a sort of comprehending of, of disability. Tracy, um, you wanted to say something. How do you deal with the, make your point, but, but I was also interested in how do you deal with the educational side of bringing people through a transformative experience? But, but go ahead, uh, make the point that you wanted to make. Oh, no, no, I, I, com- I completely I couldn't agree more with what, you know, Tom and Charles are saying, you know, and, and these these changes are often, unfortunately, slow and generational. Um, you know, I, I do think that every generation uh, now is more accepting and more understanding and, and better educated. Um, you yeah, know, but you know, it's the education, it's the understanding, it's the um, uh, breaking down those barriers and misconceptions. You know, I, th- I think that, you know, when people consider someone having a disability, there's almost this hands-off kind of stigma of, I don't know what to do with this person or for this person. Um, and, you know, understanding disability is really complicated. Uh, dis- uh, developmental disabilities in themselves are such a broad category, you know, and then you have intellectual disabilities are included in that category, but not all intellectual disabilities are technically developmental disabilities. So it's, it's really developing that understanding that, you know, we're all people, we're all unique. Um, and, and whether we have an exceptionality or not, we all have our own competencies and potentials and strengths and weaknesses. So when I come clothed in all my ignorance, but I have goodwill, but I just have my attitudes. I come and I have my attitudes. I grew up with those attitudes. Mm-hmm. So, Tom, I, I, I see you're smiling a bit because this is familiar to you, right? So if I come into your doors, how do you, how do you help me to take my, my unconscious ignorance, shift that, and, and use the goodwill which, which is in me and the willingness to change. Right? How do you, you know, give I, a break for, for how I'm coming to you, right? You know, I, I, I think, uh, I think we, we try to come as, as partners, right? I mean, we, we open our doors. We, we want to build as many relationships and contacts as possible, knowing that the first time, uh, you know, we're, we're making uh, – it's like any other relationship. You're getting to know each other. You're getting getting comfortable. The, the more uh, contact that we have, uh, whether that's as an organization with the outside community, as individuals with one another, the more contact we have, the more familiarity we have, the more perspective that each of us gains. So, so that, that's that's our approach then with uh, with those we, we serve and, and the community around us. So, you know, we, we do a lot of volunteer engagement, a lot of, uh, you know, bringing people into our, our facilities. And we we also try to, uh, you know, host a, an ice cream social, host a block party, host those types of things to, to really connect with the world around us, knowing that each time we all get a little bit better. So is the first step is just talking to each other? You know, I, I think it is. You know, I, I think as an industry, when we went from these large institutions into community-based services, we wanted to blend in. We wanted to disappear. No one wanted to stand out. 
Um, and now we're, we're kind of seeing the downside of that is, you know, we're, we're still sort of hidden away. We don't want to stand out for, for the, uh, the old reasons of, uh, you know, being a, 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 you know, a tough neighbor or any, anything like that, but we want to stand out for being that, that place that, that everybody feels welcome. Everybody feels, uh, feels is, is comfortable, um, you know, coming to and borrowing a cup of sugar, whatever it is. We, we want to stand out in those good ways and, and we don't want to just blend in or disappear anymore. So that's that's really interesting. Just sort of being present, right? And 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 helping helping people like me to change, right? Is, is that part of your strategy as well, Charles Tracy? Is it is it just to sort of say, hey, you know, come with your discomfort, come with come how you how you are, and and be part of us. Yeah, I think the first step is to come. You know, be be there and and recognizing that when people enter our orbit for, for the organizations that we, that we lead, they, they're interested, they're curious. And I think they're, they're probably open to change. And so we want to be uh, as leaders, the ones who are challenging assumptions and helping people do that. I think that there's, there's a, uh, you can meet people halfway and, and the fact that they have expressed interest in volunteering or, you know, some kind of association that, that suggests um, that curiosity, which we should, we should take the opportunity. You know, we just finished a a, um, a poll, really interesting. We, we asked the difficult question, right? How much does society invest in supporting the needs of individuals with developmental disabilities and their families? Right? It's, it's easy to say uh, we're supportive. It's hard to say I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to pay for the benefit of others. And we, we got 100%, but it was a very low group, uh, low number of people who answered, and w- which indicates discomfort with something that is very difficult. What kind of a sacrifice do we all make? The, the American with Disabilities Act um, really addressed some of the need for society to really pay attention. But how do you deal with that discomfort and the fact that, that these services are expensive and uh, all of us would have to sacrifice a little for the common good? It's part of that social compact that we have. How do we deal with that? And, and, and anyone uh, who, who cares to answer, Tracy, you want to you want to give a shot? Sure, sure. I, you know, I, I think we have to be thought leaders and continue to be thought leaders and partners with our our local and state and federal legislators. Um, you know, for for us to continue to make these great strides, our, our government via future legislation has to place value and make appropriate investments in people with disabilities. And there's a joyful um, advocacy as Easter Seals has always done, right? There's a joyfulness about Easter Seals work, uh, the brightness of the colors and the, and um, really the, the whole idea of just making it fun. I mean, isn't part of it is, is making interactions with others just, a, you know, a ball? Absolutely. There, there's a lot of fun in what we do. It's a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of fun. And, and you know, but this, the stark reality, you know, is talking about employment. Under 18 percent of adults with a disability are, are employed as compared to their non-disabled counterparts in the labor in the workforce, which have a 62 percent employment rate. So, you know, I think we have to, to keep driving home those points. Um, you know, there's a there's a place for everyone and everyone has a place and there's an opportunity for everyone to contribute. Those things are just not the same for everyone. So we've got to keep driving those points home. And I think Charles made a great point that, you know, th- things don't look like they did 40, 50, 60 years ago. Work environments don't look like they did. You know, virtual work can open up the whole world of employment for people with disabilities. Living situations have to change. You know, we've existed in, in, in common community-based models, marginally successful for the last 30 or so years, but those just aren't really meeting the needs of the changing face of disability now. So I think it's up to us. It's incumbent on us to get in front of our legislators to make these real changes that are going to impact our 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 folks we support for the next 30, 40, 50 years? That's a, that's a great question. Charles, what is the next thing that we have to be doing? Um, and I'm not just talking about um, a law uh, here. I'm talking about an actual program that should be funded 
through Elwin or through some other uh, organization that would do the most good? Is it is it is it the job situation addressing the job situation as as Tracy indicated, or are there other programs that we ought to really pay attention to? No, I, I don't know if Tracy and Tom are experiencing this, but you know, with our scale, we have really felt the impact of the the, the correction in the workforce in the labor uh, market, where, where you need to have great people who are, are committed to our mission uh, to support individuals either in the school or in their homes, and that's really been turned on its head by the pandemic, and and it's not simply uh, the initial. Uh, you know, contraction that occurred uh, and the unemployment that followed. But, you know, that, that's behind us. What, what, we, what we've emerged with is, you know, a, a workforce that was, quite frankly, underpaid, uh, given the importance of the work that they were doing. Uh, and, and, and now, along with the entire uh, uh, American workforce, has, has come to realize that they have um, leverage. And, and, you know, we've always believed that that was uh, uh, a, a cause that we needed to get behind was to, was to uh, bring to, was to modernize the the engagement of our employees because of because of the role that they play for individuals we support. But that has been accelerated over the last um, two years, and I think programs that allow organizations, particularly nonprofits that don't have access to cap, to, to, to equity markets, uh, to, to to fund. Uh, a different price point and, and, and wage offering and different benefits and, and, and keep employees. I mean, that, that to me is the key to the success for any organization that's uh, uh, trying to scale the support for, for persons with disabilities. You know, one of the things that really strikes me is that the costs are always going to be there, right? If you don't take care of somebody, the cost will be there. The cost will be there in terms of misery, homelessness, um, uh, uh, abuse, of, uh, uh, of an individual, the costs are going to be there, right? So for um, to, to provide at a somewhat higher cost support for somebody who needs it, actually it, it, it nets out as a, as a real positive for society. I think that what you're saying, Charles, is that we have to kind of navigate in between. Now, that doesn't mean that we create wage differentiation or use this as an excuse for wage differentiation where the same work is somehow compensated less or supported less, right? But what we what we need to do is we need to figure out, given particular circumstances in particular communities, different solutions that fit that, that situation. Tom, um, how do you see um, uh, Charles's point that, that we really ought to look at the constellation of need in a particular area or for particular individuals or classes of individuals, and then figure out how to create the maximum benefit for that particular circumstance. Yeah, you know, I, I think as, as an industry, especially with the, the large amounts of funding, you know, that, that is the challenge, making sure that we're right-sizing the, the amount of benefit funding uh, to the, the needs of the individual and not looking at, you know, blanket rates or facility rates, but we're looking at, you know, rates that, that fund the needs and, and goals of that person. I think that's, that's something that Minnesota has been working on certainly for the last five years with a, 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 an actual framework system that, uh, that that tries to get at that. But of course, there's there's always difficulties with it. But, you know, I, I think Charles's point about the, the labor uh, shortage in, in our country and our in our world right now um, has has changed what that funding looks like. You know, the, the needs are still there, but it costs a heck of a lot more than it did even two years ago to meet those needs. And, and so I think that's where, you know, regardless of, of the system and, and reporting and, and right sizing of those rates, Things just cost more. Um, Are you that, sure that that Living Well Disability Services doesn't get a bloated managerial overhead, um, and and that most of the resources go to the actual people that you serve? Do you have particular standards in your organization to assure that that your uh, your infrastructure does not um, become too large given the number of people that you serve? Yeah, you know, I think that's a, a really important aspect of, of what we do, and and we do maintain, you know, whether it's GuideStar, Minnesota uh, Council of Nonprofits, we we try to uh, operate within that that proper margin for us. We're really proud that we're about ten cents on the dollar, uh, so that, uh, that that we are, you know, ninety percent uh, at least of our funding is going straight to the the folks that uh, that, that it should be. Um, and, and, and Tracy, we're, we're, Charles, do you also have similar standards to the one that Tom cited? Yeah, you know. I 
Go ahead, go ahead, Tracy. Sorry. Go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, yeah. Mark, we we do, and I, and I appreciate you asking that. That is something that we also pride ourselves on. Uh, we run about an eleven percent admin rate, um, and and we're we're comfortable with that. Um, it works. We have the infrastructure that we need. Uh, I do think that funders and donors look at that. It's important to to them to know that you are running a, a lean uh, organization. But on the flip side of that, you know, you, you, you do have to you do have to have the right administrative folks and, and infrastructure in place to keep the wheels on the bus. So, yeah, yeah, um, I agree with Tom on that. And, and you know, I, it, it is something actually that they'll look at the, the other side to, to Tracy's point. You know, if you're not spending enough, you, you'll, you'll be you'll be underfunding your, your uh, you know, logistics and, and all that and, and actually not running a proper business. So so it is this balance. You know, you want to you want to have enough and, and not too much. But uh, we, we kind of get called to the carpet on both ends, I think. There's there's so much emphasis, I think, um, over the last couple of decades on what's the sweet spot for a nonprofit in terms of administration that I, I, I think it's actually much more common for organizations to under, under resource uh, as, they, as they grow, as they scale up. And, and there's as much danger, if not more, uh, being at you know, six cents on the dollar as there is to 26 cents. You know, I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that we've done over the last two years is really to, to take a look at um, you know, first of all, accept the fact that uh, the, the higher wages are the cost of, of, of pursuing our mission. And so it's incumbent upon leaders like us to, 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 to run our businesses uh, in a way that allows for uh, people to have a living wage and to do great support while doing so. And, and that means you, you have to stop acting like a charity you know, and, 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 and run your business like a nonprofit business. And, and uh, uh, sometimes that means adding, you know, investment in technology and adding investment in your, 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 your finance department so that you can make sure that uh, the organization is sustainable and, 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 and do good stewardship. So it's that's such a great point, point, Charles. I mean, you are a customer service business. You're a customer serving organization, right? You have diverse um, uh, services that you provide to, to customers. It could be a travel agency with their diverse services. It could be an accounting firm with their diverse services. You happen to have a group of people who need specific competencies that, that uh, you bundle into services that are different than financial competencies or accounting competencies that a CPA firm would have, but they are, it's a service business nonetheless, and it has to be run accordingly. That's your point, right? Yeah, I mean, we are human beings who are supporting the, the welfare, safety, and health of other human beings. It is a people business. And so, uh, you know, we have to accept, I think, the costs that are associated with doing that right uh, and, and then create efficiencies that make it possible to sustain that. And of course, the intelligence of the group is, is so manifest. We just completed a poll. We're going to give uh, you a word, Tom, and Tracy, we're going to give you the last word on this since we're coming to the end of our time. Our poll was which of these measures do you believe would be most effective in helping individuals with, with uh, developmental disabilities in the United States? And the most uh, uh, votes uh, accrued to improved support, right? Improve the whole service provision that you were referencing, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, Tom, what do you think is the most important act that I can undertake today to improve the situation for my fellows who uh, need uh, my, my understanding and support on the developmental disability side. You know, I, I think the biggest thing that, that we ask everybody, our staff, our donors, our, our parents, is to uh, connect and, and tell, tell our stories. Help us, uh, help us expand our reach by, by just telling, telling stories of the, the good work that, uh, that, that our staff do every day. And, and that's, that's, I think, the, the biggest thing that, uh, that really helps us. I, I think it, it speaks to that familiarity we talked about a, a while ago. It, it tugs on heartstrings. It, it, it connects. And, it, you know, hopefully if we're doing it right, it illustrates one of the earlier points that, that we made is that we're, we're all people. We are, we're all individuals. We all have our own, our own needs, our own interests, our, our, uh, our, our own goals, things like that. So, you know, by, by telling those stories, we, we, we put an actual name and a face on, on our services. Instead of saying people with disabilities, we say John likes to go to baseball games. And, and the, the more that we do that as an industry, I think the, the better off we all are. 
And perhaps giving a little bit of time and, tre and treasure, um, Tracy, to Elwyn, to Living Well, and to Easter Seals, no? Absolutely. Get, get to know us. Get to know your neighbors. Um, uh, under, understand that, that our world is changing and that at this point, one in four adults are living with some sort of disability that impacts major life activities and that those numbers are going to continue to increase as our baby boomer numbers increase. So disability is touching all of us. It's not so foreign anymore. It's very close. So get to know us, get to know your neighbors. Um, understand that the work we do, as Charles said, it, it, it is work. Even though we are nonprofits, we're, we're in the business of helping people. And uh, we are real businesses who are, who are providing real important services. Such an important point. If we take the distinction of, of different types of disabilities and we erase them, the person with a heart condition who has limited physical mobility, the person with neuropathy, the person who has cancer, the person who is aged, the person who is very young, the person who has a physical handicap or has a developmental handicap, we're all the same. And, and it, will all, it will be us at some point even if it's only through age. So just sort of trying to encounter that, dealing with our discomfort and, and trying to integrate it is really just something that will help us all. Uh, I'd like to, to thank you so much for, for helping us gain some understanding. Tracy Gardner, CEO of Easter Seals, Louisiana, Tom Gillespie, President and CEO of Living Well Disability Services of Minnesota, and Charles McLister, CEO and President Elwin in Philadelphia. You are our heroes. Your people are our heroes, your boards, your donors, your volunteers are our heroes. Thank you so much for helping us navigate this very, very complicated topic. And everybody stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Pleasure. Take care.